Jeremiah chapter 3 and 4. This morning, or this evening's theme is repentance, a heart of repentance. I remember hearing a story of an evangelist who was talking with his worship leader, and as they were walking in New York City, they were walking across the street, it was a green light, and immediately the man stopped in his tracks, and the worship leader said, what's wrong, what's wrong? He said, I just sinned, and I need to confess it before the Lord. And that's a heart of repentance, a heart that's um, open to himself to see that I've got sin in my life and I need to take care of that before my Lord and Savior, before I even take another step. So having a heart of repentance. In these two chapters, God will be asking Israel to repent several times, several times. His hand just goes out over and over and over again. They don't repent. Uh, They don't turn from their ways, but God keeps asking them to repent and to stop doing what it is that they are doing because they're into idolatry, idolatry. Now, idolatry in the Old Testament is that they would make idols, wooden idols, golden idols, out of metals and so forth, and then they would take these idols and they put them on hills, and they have altars and they do sacrifices, and they would come and they would worship uh, before these sacrifices. God didn't like that because these things came between Israel and God. They became idols. They, they, were, they were the in-between, and in fact, they forgot God and began to worship these idols. Today, you know, we don't worship idols. That's kind of silly, but yet there, there are cultures that do. Catholicism still does. You know, they won't tell you that they do, but they pray to statues. You know, they go into a, a little area of the church and they light candles, and there's a statue there of Saint Nicholas or Saint uh, Thomas or whoever it is, and they're praying to this idol that hopefully this idol will be able to convince God, you know, in their favor and so forth. So that still happens to this day, but not not as prevalent as it was back then. Today it's more subtle, and Paul understood that. God understood that, and so he said, he said covetousness covetousness is idolatry so the things that we covet the things that we value can become idols to us why is that because they come between us and god they get in between us technology can be an idol really yeah it can be an idol if you're so into so much into technology that you're not reading your bible that you're not fellowshipping that you're not going to church that and everything's about your technology then it becomes an idol to you you know i've got the latest uh, smartphone the the i6 and it's a great tool it's the only reason that i got it though you know i kind of Mention it several times that I got the i6 and everybody goes, ooh, you got it, so what is it? I even put it on Facebook, I got the i6. And it was interesting because a couple of days later, someone uh, posted something on their wall. And it wasn't on my wall, but this is what they posted. Everyone's talking about their i6 as though it's their God. You know, and all of a sudden I'm like, ooh, wow, Lord. And I'm, I thought he's judgmental. That's what I thought. It's like, wow, someone can't even say they have an I-6, and he immediately assumes that it's someone's God, you know. And then I started thinking about it, you know. Is this my God? No, this isn't my God. I know who my God is. This does not come between me and my God. I'd throw this away in a flash. The only reason that I have this is because it is an amazing tool to use for the ministry. It is amazing. I can keep track of all my appointments right here. And they tell me when my appointments are coming, days in advance. So it helps me to stay organized. I have Bible studies on here. I have MP3s of studies. I can listen to K-Wave on here. I get all kinds of messages and studies and resources for the Bible. Is it my God? No. I've got notes on here. It's amazing. This thing does everything. Little notes. It's a notepad. You know how you have your little yellow pads that you use and you write notes on those things? That's what this is. It has a notepad. I got hundreds of those notepads in here with different topics uh, tithing I've got stuff on marriage I've got stuff on myself I got stuff on my automobiles I've got stuff things to do I got it all listed out it helps me to be more organized so that I can get stuff done I've got stuff like like coming to church and what are the things that I need to do to to get everything done so in, in it, for instance you can use a notepad and say okay Har- uh, summer fest Okay, I need to pick up all of these items. I need to go by this time and make sure I'm there and then download everything from the... You know, you write everything out and you have it right there. You just push it and it's there. 
You don't have to go on into a filing cabinet and look for it. Where did I put that thing, you know? You don't have to go look on a shelf. It's all right here. It listed in alphabetical order. It is an amazing tool. I get calls. I get texts all on this phone itself. And that's just a little bit of what it does. There is so much more that I can do. I can register. I was just looking up earlier to go to a nuts and bolts on expositorial teaching. That's going to be a Menifee. I need to uh, check into a hotel. Boom, just push a couple of buttons. There's a motel just down the street from there. And I can check in just like that. I mean, it is an amazing tool. Is it my God? No. Can it become an idol? Yes. Yes, it can. If I begin to worship this thing and depend upon it for my every answer, then yes, you know, I can push the button and say, Series, uh, um, which do you suggest I do today? <laughs> you know, then yeah, it becomes an idol to you. No, it's a resource and a tool. It's an amazing tool that God has allowed us to have to use for His glory. Can it be used for evil? Of course it can. Of course it can. And it can become an idol. Anything can become an idol in our life. Now, idolatry is very subtle. <clears throat> you have to have a sensitive heart to the Lord in order to pick up idolatry. People that are into idolatry, they don't know it because it's subtle in their life. And it can creep in without them understanding or knowing. And next thing you know, they are forgetting the Lord and the things of the Lord and they're into the world and the things of the world. That is idolatry. And it's very subtle. You have to have a heart that is in love with Jesus. And when you're in love with Jesus, and if you offend them, then um, him, if you offend him, you know it right away. I don't, I don't know if you have ever done that <clears throat> with, or experienced that with your, your spouse. And when you know that maybe you said something and you hurt them, you just know. You can tell by their demeanor, the look on their face, or the way that they respond, and you go, oh, I didn't say the right thing. Like, I'm sorry. I, I di didn't come out the way that it should have came out. You know, that is not my heart. I want you to know that I love you, and I'm going to do whatever it takes, you know, to make this right and so forth. You just know uh, because you have a relationship with that individual. And so it is with God. When you have a relationship with God, and it's an intimate relationship, it's a daily relationship, and you hear his voice because you know he hears yours, then when something tries to creep in, you know, hey, that shouldn't be there. That, that can become an idol. That can come between uh, me and the Lord. And then it becomes, it becomes what we call <clears throat> an adulterous relationship. And that's what God calls Israel uh, an adulterer. They are into idolatry towards God. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, They say, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, May he return to her again. Would not, that, would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot and many lovers, yet return to me, saith the Lord. Now, Jeremiah is quoting from Deuteronomy 24 where it does talk about marriage and divorce. That there is a legal way of leaving someone and that is only, as Jesus said, in cases of adultery. <clears throat> and we have a case here where God is saying, look, you're, you're my wife, but you're committing adultery. And what's interesting is God's not asking her to leave. He's actually asking her to repent and come back. I mean, that is definitely love and compassion. You know, so many people are so willing and ready to, to get a divorce when there is infidelity in that relationship instead of trying to work it out. And yet I've seen so many try to work it out. It, it is a touchy subject. Now I'm not saying that if there is infidelity that you should work it out. You have a right to get divorced if it's going to affect your relationship and your family and your relationship with God. God has given us that provision. It's not a sin. It's a way out. But at the same time, if you decide to stick it out, and work it out, then glory to God that he's able to work in your relationship and bring glory to himself. God is a God of love, and he loves, and he loves us very much, and he doesn't want to divorce us because of the spiritual adultery that takes place in our life. There is a spiritual adultery, not just a physical adultery. Now, we know that physical adultery is very painful, very painful to go through uh, on both parts. I have seen men 
totally destroyed because of it. Um, <clears throat> our manager was, that worked for Southern California Edison, he went through a series of things that would destroy any individual, and it destroyed him. He lost his son. His son used to play football at the Chino, Chino Hills uh, uh, High School there, and um, he went head on with a with a uh, another player that was on his own team during practice, and he actually fell over and died. Just just hit just perfect and so forth. His wife began to blame him because he's the one that wanted him in football. Now that alone would just devastate a marriage. She blamed him. He couldn't take it, you know. So he kind of distanced himself. They were arguing. He was more at work, affecting his job, affecting his job. Uh, job started to lack a little bit. His wife then had an affair because he's, he was at fault. She found comfort somewhere else because he wouldn't spend time with her. He finds out she's having an affair, affects him even more. Then the company sees that he's not doing good, so they put him in a location where he's by himself. They isolate him even more, so forth. And so all of this together, along with the adultery, you know, and the lack in their relationship and what is done, he ended up going to, um, I think it's Claremont, where the, uh, the train comes in, Amtrak, in the, in the shuttle, and he threw himself in front of it. That's how devastating divorce is, adultery is. It, it kills people, you know, unless you're a very strong individual and you know the Lord very deeply. And this man knew the Lord. He, he witnessed all the time. But it can destroy you. And so that's the physical adultery. Imagine what we're doing to the Lord as we have idols between us and Him. It, just, it doesn't destroy Him. It hurts His heart to see us go, for Him to see us go through what we go through when He loves us so much. But what's interesting here is that He's not willing to give them up. I mean, you play the harlot with many lovers. And He's not just saying individuals. Again, this is spiritual adultery. Many idols. And there were a lot of idols that they, they worshipped. And yet, He says, Return to me, saith the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see where you where have you not lain with men by the roads you have set for them like an Arabian in the wilderness and you have polluted the land with your harlotry and your wickedness. Now, these are repercussions for living a life without God. The God that you know, there's going to be those repercussions in your life. Therefore, the showers, he says, have been withheld. The rain has stopped. And there have, has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Again, it's subtle. Idolatry is subtle. Uh, there is no shame in it. And in fact, these are the kind of people that, that when you bring it up to them, if they understand or know a little bit that they're possibly wrong, and you might bring it up, they say, why are you judging me? And it's one of the first things they say, why are you judging me? You have no right to judge me. You know, because they're guilty and they know it. And by the way, we're not judging them. They're already judged. John chapter 3 says we're all condemned already. Uh, our destination is condemnation. Only those that come to Jesus Christ are, get out of that condemnation. Uh, the world is condemned already. And so, you know, when they say, oh, these Christians condemn us, no, you're already condemned. God has already condemned the whole world because they're living without God. We're not judging you. We're trying to correct you. But people don't receive it that way. Why? Because it's subtle. It's in their lives, and they don't want to get rid of that idol. And so they take offense to it. So her promiscuity had brought this pollution and drought in the land because of her shamelessness. Will you not from this time cry to me, my father? You're not the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. And so Judah, in a sense, had spoken, but yet they continued to do those things. They pretended. In other words, to repent. You know, kind of like what we do today. We pretend to repent. We pretend that we're okay. We pretend that, that we're right with the Lord. Oh yeah, I've confessed that. And, you know, and, and in reality, we haven't really repented. And really that's the key is true repentance. There's a form of repentance that isn't true. Uh, true repentance is sorrow, sorrowful for what you have done and you're willing to turn from that. 
2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's a sorrow in the world. Uh, read, that, read that chapter, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. And it gives you those two types of repentance. Worldly repentance, you know, those are the guys that when they get caught, oh man, I got caught, I'm sorry. They're sorry they got caught. They're not really repented, they're not really sorry. And if you let them go, they'll do the same thing over again. I was just um, reading a, an article of a man who, um, oh, I'm trying to remember it right now, just here in Riverside County, who had... Um, done something, gone into a store, and he was stealing um, over here off of Magnolia, and this security guard who was off duty saw him steal this stuff, so he pulled him, pulled him you know, aside and said, hey, get over here, and then took him to management, and so management took the stuff back and then kind of reprimanded him and sent him off, you know, so don't ever come back and do that again, and the guy says, you know, have you seen him before, you know, I mean, what's going on? He goes, oh yeah, we see him here all the time, he does this all the time. You know, so he's not sorry, you know, he, there's no repentance, and then they kind of cater to it by just letting him go because there's no consequences either, you know, so he just continues to do that over and over again. So there's a worldly repentance, but then there is a godly repentance, one that's really sorrowful for what they've done, and they're willing to make amends for what they've done. You know, they're willing to go beyond and say, look, I'm willing to take care of it if I owe you know, something to someone, I'll pay that debt, you know, I'll go back and make it right, whatever that is. And so um, he now calls them to repentance here in the next few verses. Remember, this was the first message that Jeremiah had to Israel here, and now verse 6 starts the second message, and this, it starts with the call to repentance. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah, remember Josiah, you can find Josiah, a young king of eight years old, a young man, God anointed and filled him, he became the king of Israel, and he began to make everything right. He tore down the altars on the hills. He got the the, the wicked priests and he slayed them and he, he cut, tried to cleanse the land of all of this stuff. You can read in Second Kings 23 all about him. And so he tried the best that he could, but yet it wasn't enough. He said, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. Again, speaking of the idols, and I said, after she had done all these things, return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And so this is Israel, speaking of Josiah, who was their king, and Israel itself was into idolatry. And God, again, asked them to repent and to turn back to him, and yet Judah, who was related to Israel in a sense, broken tribe, but they saw this, and they also uh, did not turn then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So God divorced Israel because of this adultery. Now, it wasn't a permanent divorce because God made a covenant with Israel and he would be faithful to that covenant but in a sense he's saying I'm letting you go right now and you can experience what you have begun and you will also experience the repercussions of that I find it's interesting that that I I see a lot of people who have gone through the road of divorce get married and then get divorced again and then get married and then get divorced again uh, that says something. It should say something to them. They're not. They're not wise. First of all, uh, they're not doing something right. You know, uh, they're just jumping around until hopefully they get lucky. I guess in their mind, instead of depending upon the Lord and being faithful to what the Lord has said in His Word. Really, and that's the key in itself: is what has God said? Is this Word the truth? Do you believe it from Genesis to Revelation, and are you applying it to your life? Because if you are, then your relationship's going to prosper and be fruitful. That's just the word. That's what the word of God does. It, it's seeds that are planted in a good heart, and when it grows, it brings forth good fruit. 
uh, the reason that there's bad fruit is because we're not applying it. And it's just that simple. You might be saying, well, wait a minute, you don't know my situation. It doesn't matter. If you apply the word, if you apply the word, God promises that there will be fruit there. And if there's no fruit, then something else is going on. I'm talking about fruit. I'm not talking about troubles and trials. That's something different. I'm talking about fruit. There's fruit because this is good. When you, when you eat of the word of God, you're going to be healthy. And then you will be in a healthy relationship. Now, it doesn't mean you won't go through trials and struggles and God's building that relationship up in individuals also. But we need to stick with the word of God. It's really that simple. Verse 9, so it came to pass through her casual harlotry, har- harlotry that she defied the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. And, and again, highlight that, whole heart. It's a pretense. God wants our heart more than anything else. God doesn't want your wallet. God doesn't want your service. He doesn't even want your lip service. What God wants is your heart. That's the key to our relationship with God is the heart. In Mark chapter 7, verse 5, the Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders? but eat bread with unwashed hands. What they were saying was, hey, we wash our hands and we keep the traditions of our elders. See, we're good. We do what's right. How come your disciples don't do that and yet you have a relationship with them? That was the question. We're right on. We do everything right. We've got the right perspective. You know, we've, we've got the plan. God is... Our father Abraham is using us in a sense. So why is it that your disciples aren't following the the traditions of the elders? And he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy to you hypocrites? As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Wow. Who can read hearts? I can't, but God can. And Jesus says, you're hypocrites. You say you follow the traditions of our Father, another place, Jesus says, you, you, you keep the commandments, but yet, yet you don't honor your father and your mother, which is one of the Ten Commandments, and they weren't doing that. And so they were just saying it because of their lips. They wore the robes, they wore the phylacteries, they were on the corners, they threw dust themselves because they were fasting and praying and so forth, but it was all lip service. There was no heart service. There's a big difference there. A heart that is broken before the Lord is a heart that weeps before him. A heart that is cold has no response whatsoever to God. It doesn't have a desire to please God. Only a heart that is in love with God and a broken heart will serve the Lord. Our hearts need to be broken. Our hearts need to be the Lord. Does it break you? when you sin or do you blame others it's not my fault someone else did it no you don't understand no you don't you don't get the picture no you don't get it because when you sin god says you don't sin against man you sin against god it's our relationship with god and he wants your heart because he loves you that much he came to die for your heart to have that relationship with you. But yet they honor with their lips and their hearts are far from me, he said. And in vain they worship me. They come to church and they're sinning all week long and they come to church and they're praising God, hallelujah, praise you Jesus, we love you Lord. But then all week long they're sinning against the Lord. They're living a double life like a hypocrite. That's hypocrisy. You know, um, I'm gonna go down that road. For lying... Aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men, the washing of pitchers, cups, and many other things you do. Oh, they would wash the cups and the pitchers, and they'd have their traditions, and they'd make sure they did everything just right. But those were the commandments of men. It was an outward showing to men that I'm righteous. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. I even come in here and I serve. But then when you go away, 
your hearts are far from the Lord. Only you know that because you're there. He goes on in verse 18 when you go down uh, from that same chapter. uh, So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Again, it's very deceptive how sin enters in and we don't understand it because we're not willing to receive the truth. And so we blame others when we sin. Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man and from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated thus purifying all foods so what he's saying is look you guys are talking about the traditions and 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 eating and and the foods and washing of hands but what does that have to do with the heart all you're doing is you're eating and it just goes out the other end there's really nothing there that deals with the heart issues itself don't you see that And he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, thieves, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things, or all these evil things, come from within that defile a man. These are things that come from the heart. If you're involved in any of these things, adultery, fornication, that's pornography, murder, that's hatred, thief, stealing from your company, stealing from your parents, stealing from anyone, covetousness, wickedness, just being a wicked person, deceitful, you're deceitful, you're lying all the time, you're cheating all the time, lewdness, an evil eye, blaspheming, even pride, thinking you have all the answers. That's what pride is. You think you have the answers. You think you already know what's right. I was sharing with the guys on Monday that pride says I have the right way. I'm the guy that God wants to use. Because no one else is getting used. And I was sharing about this individual coming to the area. And comes from a very big church. And he was able to minister at that church. Teach the word of God. And there were hundreds if not a thousand people coming to listen to him. Can you imagine what that does to your head? And so he came to the area thinking. God needs to use me here. This place needs him. And so he even mentioned that several churches in the community said, God's not using them. We're one of them that God's not using. Several others. And he came here and he started a Bible study. And he went to one other church and said, hey, God's called me here to start a Bible study. Well, summer wasn't even over and it went down the tubes. And so he came to him and said, hey, I just want to let you know I I stopped doing the Bible study. He was humbled. (laughs) Because he thought he had the answers. He thought his teaching was the best in this area. And that's pride. Now you go to an area saying, Lord, if you can use me there, man, I, I hope you can use me there. You go there in humility. My ideas are nothing. And if I have an idea and if it works, it's like Peter. Lord, you are the Christ. And, and what did Jesus say? Peter, you're a smart guy. Man, I'm glad I have you on my team. That's not what he said. He said, Peter, God revealed that to you. He humbled them. If I have a good idea, it's not my idea. It's God's idea. And if it works, especially, it's God's idea. We need to be careful. God wants our hearts. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Have I really made a full commitment to God with my heart? Because God is calling us away from this world. He doesn't want us to be a part of this world. Listen to 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. We're not to love this world. We're not to love these technology. These are things that help us with the ministry. But if we're, you're in love with the world and the world comes between church and, 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 and you, then you're in the world. And anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in you, John says. John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. It's of the world. 1 John 2.17, the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. 
That's forever. That's where we should be at. Doing the will of the Lord and abiding forever. But the lust of the world will only perish. Moses said, sin, sin is pre- pleasurable, right? But it's only for a season. Oh, you might have some fun with it, but it's only for a season, and then you stand before God. Remember what Second Peter 4, 1, 4 said, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through its lust, we have escaped from it, that we no longer are held by it. And so we love the world less, and we love God more. And so we, sh- we show the fruit of that by serving the Lord even more. Now he calls them to repentance again for the second time. Go, go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return, black, backsliding Israel, says the Lord, and then I will not cause my anger to fall on you. For I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquities. Boy, highlight that one. That's all God wants. Is just acknowledge your sin on a daily basis. Don't cover it up. I didn't lie to you. Come on, you're lying. Stop it. God isn't going to honor that. I didn't do that. You're lying. You know, you did do it. Be honest before the Lord because God already knows and so you can't hide things from God. Proverbs says in 28, 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. That's what I want to do is find mercy. And so immediately when I sin and I know I'm saying, Lord, forgive me, please forgive me, help me with this, Lord, I don't want to continue on in this, help me, Father. I do this all day long. You know, Lord, if I had pride right now, Lord, get rid of it, Father. If I spoke out of turn, Lord, stop me, Lord, stop me, Lord. And so being a person that confesses all day long, not concealing your sin, but confessing it to the Lord. I'm not telling you to go tell people, I'm saying confess it to God. Between you and him. That's what it's about. That you have transgressed against the Lord. And so confess it because you've sinned against God. And have scattered your charm to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord. For I am married to you. I will take you. One from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. The next few verses now, he speaks of the millennium age. And so you can see it pretty clearly as he talks about uh, the things that will be happening during the millennium, that thousand year reign. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Do we have that right now? You know, not everywhere. There are a few good shepherds. Uh, who are out there, who have a heart to share with God's people. And, and if you have a, a pastor who has a heart for God's people, then you have a good shepherd. You know? I know that that's my heart, is to feed God's people. And that's why we go through the word of God chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so that we understand it all, what God is saying, and just expound on the text itself. I want to see people grow. Uh, I, I hope that people will understand what Jesus is saying. And I hope that I relay the message that Jesus loves people, that loves you and cares about you and all these other things, idolatry and sin, only harms you. It destroys you. It doesn't help you. And so you need to work on getting rid of that stuff in your life. That, that is my hope. My hope is to restore those who, who don't understand there's a, a, f- a principle that is taught to the pastors at Calvary Chapel. Um, we, we don't have manuals, you know. We don't have manuals that we go to, okay, when this happens, this is what you do. What they say is, you teach your people what you have learned. And so what you have experienced with God and in your relationship, then you teach your people those things. And they'll learn them too. And so what you go through, I've been through. And when I share with you on how to handle that or how to get rid of something or how to work and serve the Lord, it's all through the experience that I had in serving the Lord. You know, very important. I, I share with you about the phone. You know, I know that when you're serving the Lord, there's a lot going on. 
a lot going on. And, and when you're in various ministries, boy, there's even more going on that you have to remember. And so as I said earlier, if you have a summer fest, I write everything down right there, what I need to do. I don't forget those things then. And I'm not running back and forth wasting time and being an unfaithful steward. I write it all down. I know exactly what I need to do. And I make sure everything gets covered so that it doesn't affect the ministry, doesn't affect people, doesn't, you know, to the best of my ability. I mean, obviously, you know, you're not perfect, but you do the best you can with what you have. And you strive to be the best. But when you just come in and not do everything, you just come in lackadaisical and want to just sit around and talk and not do anything and not fulfill everything, then you miss things and then the ministry doesn't run well. Yeah. And so I've just been taught what I've been taught, I teach to others. That's a good heart because we want to serve the Lord to the best of our ability and we want to present ourselves before God. And so the whole purpose here, the saying is that God will raise up those men. Then it shall come to pass when you are multiplied and increase in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. In other words, the ark of the covenant's not needed during the millennium because the Messiah is there. So there's no need for it to even think about it. Uh, the ark was that the ark of the covenant that God had put the the tablets in, and Aaron's rod and so forth, and they carried it everywhere. And it was a a, a sign to them of God's covenant with Israel. It's lost to this day. We don't know where it's at, but we think about it constantly in Israel. They say they're gonna they're gonna bring it back uh, during the tribulation period. And the Antichrist will will desecrate it there in the temple. But he's saying during the millennium reign, that is after the tribulation period is over and a thousand years reign. There's no need for it. We don't even have to think about it at that time. In those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. In other words, God's people will be united. And they won't be arguing and fighting anymore. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. But I said, how can I put you among the children and give you a pleasant land, a beautiful heritage of the hosts of nations? And I said, you shall call me my father and not turn away from me. Another call of repentance again. Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so you have dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. A voice was heard on the desolate heights, weeping and supplication of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their ways. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hope, for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains truly in the Lord our God is salvation of Israel they're pretty much saying it's in God and God alone we've come to you we know that you're the Lord that's why Jesus can say I'm the way the truth and the life no one can get to the Father except through me there's only one way to heaven and that is through Jesus Christ all other ways are sinking sand it's through Jesus alone very narrow is the way Truly in vain is salvation hope for from the hills and from the multitude of the mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is salvation of Israel. For shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth because of the sin, their shame. The labors of our fathers from the youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and daughters. We lie down in our shame and our reproach covers us for we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers from our youth even to this day and have not obeyed the voice of our God. Now we come to chapter 4 and I think that we can get this done. Another call of repentance. If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abomination out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. You shall 
swear the Lord lives in truth and judgment and in righteousness and nations shall bless themselves in him and in him they shall glory. Another call, the fifth call now of repentance in verse three. Thus says the Lord to men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcision was a covenant that God made with Abraham as a sign to them that God would keep his covenant by multiplying them as a nation and they weren't doing that because of the idolatry so he says circumcise yourselves and take away the foreskin of your heart you men of judah the inhabitants of jerusalem least my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings now notice he said circumcise the foreskin of your heart it was not necessarily the actual foreskin but it was the heart that he was looking to be circumcised because our hearts are attached to the things that we love when you're into idolatry, you know, by the way, a, a, a person can be an idol to you. If you're in love with somebody so much that it comes between you and God, that's idolatry. Your heart can be attached to that person so much. That's why it's so important that I not love my wife that much. Because it can sometimes get in the way of my relationship with God. Because I love her to death. I love her to death. But I have to love God more than my wife even and she has to love God more than she loves me and that's evident to me because she's still with me because <laughs> if she didn't love God more she would be gone a long time ago but she loves God enough that she sticks it out with me with all the garbage that I give her and so we need to detach our hearts from these things and attach it to God God wants our hearts. He's a person and he's real and he wants that relationship. Again, now he, he pronounces a woe upon them. Verse five, declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpets in the land. Cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities. Set up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge, do not delay for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from its thickets, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitants. For this, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail, for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. So, in other words, he's going to bring this nation down, and they're going to destroy them in Jerusalem and take them into captivity. So he's giving them up for a season then i said verse 10 ah ah oh lord god surely you have greatly deceived this people in jerusalem saying um you shall have peace whereas the sword reaches to the heart at that time it will be said to this people and to jerusalem the dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness towards the daughters of my people not to fan or to cleanse a wind too strong for those uh, these will come for me now I will also speak judgment against them, that is, those nations. Behold, he shall come up like clouds, and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. And so though these nations are coming, in, in this case it's Babylon, the lion, the dry wind, the clouds, and so forth, though God will judge them after 70 years. O oh, Jerusalem, wash your hearts. There's that word heart again. From wickedness that you may be saved how long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you for a voice declared from dan and proclaim a affliction from mount ephraim make mention to the nations just proclaim against jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and rise their, raise their voice against the cities of judah like keepers of the field, they are against her all around because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. You can imagine them going through this great battle as these nations are approaching them and they're fighting these wars with them because apparently, you know, apparently they, they resisted at first. You know, of course, they were, were destroyed and captured. Uh, but the, the whole time just thinking, you know, why is this happening? And here's this great nation going to overtake us. And, and yet not thinking 
This, we have brought this upon ourselves. Yeah, we've brought this upon ourselves. And that's what they did. They brought it upon themselves. And God is writing them and telling them this. You've done this because of your wicked hearts. Because you have loved other things besides me. Yeah. And I think of our nation today and, and where we're at. I, I mentioned to you, I think it was Sunday, that our nation, our forefathers had a choice whether to go with the Greek education or the Hebrew education. The Greek education, as I said, was to to focus on the mind and understanding and and knowledge. Uh, but what you what happens there is you create a very smart, wicked person <laughs> when you do that. The Hebrew education system focuses on character. How do we build a, the character in an individual and then give them the knowledge of God and those things about morals and values and of people and, and, and so forth? And when you do that, you build good character and thus you have a good nation, a blessed nation. What have we done? We've gone back to the Greek ideology, right? Where today it's not about God. Let's take the Ten Commandments, which teaches morals and character, out of school. Let's take prayer out of school. And let's just teach strictly knowledge and information that they're capable of doing it themselves that we all evolved and so there's no value in people we're just a part of a system and so people don't value one another and it's sad when an individual doesn't value another individual that they're so self-centered and selfish they don't even uh, consider another individual whatsoever uh, from what i understand serial killers are like that they, they have no no emotional sense of of moral value you know, they can go in and, and kill a person and as a person's laying there dead, get hungry and then sit down and just eat. You know, and not even think it's strange because they're so numb to it. They have no feelings. And that's what we've created in our society with these young children and now adults in corporate America. And so they can, they can come in and, and take all these elderly people money and say they're investing it, and the whole time they're just keeping it themselves and not feel remorse for it whatsoever because they're so selfish and because we evolved and it's, it's about you know, the survival of the fittest and how much we can take advantage of other people. I was reading an article today about Riverside County that in the early 1900s there was a, a group of men that belonged to an association, and they did that here. Uh, in Riverside County. The bridge that goes over to Norco, over the Santa Ana River, I guess the person that got elected to the uh, <clears throat> manager's position to oversee all that was taking kickbacks to allow certain groups to build that thing. And so that's the kind of society that you create because you go back to, to just knowledge and information and education, but there's no character being built. Without character... You know, and moral values, we destroy our nation. And that's where we're at today, unfortunately. And so we deserve to be destroyed. I know that we'll defend ourselves as best that we can and we want to share the gospel, but judgment's coming upon us. And God's going to allow that judgment to come. Uh, even in, within the Christian church, it's sad that the churches don't vote to change the way that our nation is. In California alone, we have enough Christians in this state to change everything. We could get rid of everybody and every wicked law if we really wanted to, if we just stand up and vote, but we don't, and that's a shame. Then we don't take that responsibility and know what God has given us as a responsibility, a civic duty. Uh, read Romans 13. It's all right. He's raised up these, things, these, these men, the governments, to protect us. Well, as he raises them up, how does he raise them up? How does he raise up godly men? How does he raise up good Christian men within the government? Through us, because we know who they are and we vote them in. And so we need to stand up, but we don't. And so what's happening is our own fault and it's gonna come upon us just like it did with Israel and we're gonna go, what's happening? Why is this happening? And we don't realize we've done it to ourselves. So a second will, verse 19. Oh, my soul, my soul, that's, his way of saying, my anguish, my anguish. I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise 
in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpets, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tent, my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of trumpets? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. And behold, the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. Behold, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all the cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate. Yet I will not make a full end. (laughs) Yet I'm not done. Yet there's still hope. I love that about the Lord. He's still waiting For us to repent. For to this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken. I have purposed and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen, and they shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. And when you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her children, her first child. And the voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself, she spreads her hands saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murders. And you can just picture that. Why is this going on? Woe am I. This is not fair. This is not right. And yet we brought this destruction on ourselves. A man who thinks that he's in control of his own life is, for, is in for a big awakening when God brings that judgment. Yeah, when God brings that judgment. Many a man think that they're in control, and as soon as something happens, whether they get sick, whether disaster comes upon them, they realize they have no control over their life whatsoever. None whatsoever. And they have to learn to live in the conditions and in the fate that they're in, not knowing what the end result will be. See, the world will live that way. Okay, I got hurt. I'm not in control here. I can't change my situation. So what do I do? I adapt. I either become an alcoholic, a druggie, so I can cope with it, or I take prescription drugs and deal with it that way, or I just listen to the doctor say, I limit myself, and I just figure out, you know, I'm a cripple for the rest of my life. A Christian will realize God has a purpose and a reason for this. And I'm going to glorify God in it. I'm going to serve him to the best of my ability. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to give him glory forever and ever until the day that I go home because one day I will be restored. I will be healed. And God will give me a new body. That's the Christian view, which is different than the world view. So as we go through these things, and we're going to go through them. I was just listening to uh, Brigidette um, Gabrielle, and she was saying that they have... Secret Service has said there's about a hundred or so ISA terrorists in the in the United States right now. She says there's another four hundred that they don't know of, that they know are here but they don't know them, and so things are going to start happening, and we're in for a big awakening. They almost had me convinced. Uh, some of the people on Fox News and. And others were saying this is isolated because the president's trying to isolate the situation, saying this is something that's happening over there. And so it's not our problem, but it's other nations' problems, and everyone needs to kind of get involved. So he's trying to do it that route. But he's not telling us the truth of what's happening here. And it's happening here. Sharia law is even infiltrating in some of our um, states. Uh, They're trying to 
interweave Sharia law with, with our constitution. So we're going to be in a big root awakening when all of a sudden these things happen and we're going to go, what happened? Yeah, well, we were asleep. That's what happened. We need to wake up and see what's going on and, and vote and pray and seek the Lord and hopefully save as many souls as we possibly can before uh, the Lord comes because we're living in the last days.